Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Sonics. This is episode 138 with Fee Roberts. I had a great chat with Fee, and we talked about so many things, including studying engineering at SAE in London, working in big studios, transitioning into freelance engineering, what it's like working as an engineer producer. She talks about giving musicians freedom of expression, her detailed approach to miking pianos, and how deep she goes with automation, especially in string arrangements. We talk about using less compression, more saturation, how to get a deep low end, making sample libraries at Spitfire Audio, keeping scratch vocals, doubling down on herself, and basically everything in between. So it's a great chat. I think you're gonna love this conversation. So here's my conversation with Fee Roberts coming up right here on Secret Sonics. Hey everyone. If you're anything like me, you often find yourself looking for business insight in podcasts. And I'm sure many of you are also into meditation and reflection to help better understand yourself. Former guest of the show, Carl Bonner, decided to launch a podcast that brings these two elements together. It's a series of guided self-reflection exercises, but specifically for freelance creatives like you and me, focusing on the struggles we face as we try to grow our businesses, while also finding more happiness in the work that we do. It's called Thanks for Thinking. It's definitely an unusual format, but if you want to grow your self-awareness, find deeper career satisfaction, and make more money, then I think this podcast might be for you. Experience it for yourself and click the link in the show notes below. You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. And welcome back to Secret Sonics. I'm your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Fee Roberts. Fee is a London-based sound engineer and producer. Former guest of the show, Katie Tavini, recommended I reach out to Fee, who's graciously agreed to join me on the air. So with all that to say, welcome to Secret Sonics, Fee. Hello. Happy to be here. Yeah. How are you How are you doing today? I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had a good day. It's March and the sun is shining, so I've been out having a day off. It's been good. So tell the audience a little bit about your story. I'd love to hear, you know, how music started for you and how did it evolve into engineering, production, all the stuff that you do today? Yes. Well, I guess I actually had a bit of an unconventional start. I actually used to act years and years ago. I was at the Brit School in South London doing theatre. And while I was there, I was also, I'd always learnt mostly piano and a bit of singing from when I was younger. I started writing songs a little bit while I was there for the theatre performances and decided that I I really enjoyed that. And so after I left Brit School, I went to a music school called ICMP to do a a year there doing songwriting, which could have gone on to a degree, but I kind of kept it just as one year because while I was there, I got introduced to production. While I was there, they made you perform about three times a week. And I realised I didn't really like performing with my music because I'm definitely not a singer as much as Mm. I can like hold a tune and and know what the notes are and stuff. I'm not really, I've not got the best voice. You don't belt it out. No, exactly. (laughs) Definitely not one of those. Uh, But I really enjoyed the songwriting side of things. Yeah, I got introduced to production to there and I literally didn't have a clue. It was sort of the first time I'd even heard of Logic, heard of all of the things that you could do. And then, so I left that after a year and kind of spent a year or two working. I was working in in a cinema in South London. And while I was there, I met the, there was a live sound engineer who worked at the music venue above the cinema and he just sort of ended up teaching me some of some of the ropes of live sound engineering and I got a bit interested in that and he um, introduced me to some of the sound engineering universities and schools that you can go to. So I ended up at SAE in Haggerston in London. Mm. There's, an SNE, there's an SAE, I think, in New York. I don't know if they're related. Oh yeah, they are. There's like about 50 of them, I think. So all around the world. Oh, wow. So there's there's four in the mm. UK. I can't remember where they all are now. Leeds and Liverpool or something. But yeah, I was at the one in mm-hmm. London in Haggerston and doing a, a, a degree in audio production, I think the title was. I learned loads because literally from knowing absolutely nothing, I just, I, I learned abs- loads there. And during my dissertation, you could sort of decide to, make it either more creative or more geeky and get a, either a BSc or a BA. So while I was there, I did a, a prepared piano EP, I guess, and I did that for my final dissertation, sort of engineered and produced the whole thing and put weird objects inside the piano and created a whole piece based on um, a Debussy prelude because I was very into class- playing classical music when I was younger. Yeah, Debussy's great also. <laughs> he is, he's great. I say classical, I should say. 
impressionist really but yeah he's yeah right. he's one of my favorite pianists for sure yeah I don't I at the same time as I was at uni I was sometimes assisting a, an engineer called Reese Downing he was going in and out of various London studios and so whenever he needs an assistant I'd go along and help out and I learned a lot with him actually he was really good he was from the Tom Meister course yeah and worked with all kinds of different genres as well and kind of got in my foot in a few different studios while I was doing that while I was at SAE there was one supervisor who was there just in the first term uh called Jake and he he ended up leaving to become the the tech manager at Strongroom but I think he always remembered me I think he remembered me because during my first band project I brought in a trio and the the bass player had brought in his own bass amp and I think it had been modded incorrectly and so (laughs) <laughs> it, something wasn't working and we went into the live room again this was my first band project sort of first time doing like a full full band setup recording in on the to a desk and I sort of went in and the room was a little bit hazy and kind of smelt vaguely of smoke and I was like oh damn so I ran through to see Jake and I said hey he was busy with another student and I was like oh I think you need to come through and he was like no no I can't now and I was like okay I think there might be something on fire and I've never seen him run so fast and he ran through to the to the studio where I was at and he was like oh yeah we need to turn everything off but anyway so it was quite a bad introduction and a weird way for him to remember me but I think he actually remembered me from from that you saved the studio I saved the studio exactly what was the bass amp that caused the fire yeah it had been modified incorrectly I still don't really know because at that time I wasn't very clued up on electronics and things so I, I didn't really know what the problem was yeah and then about two years later he sort of messaged me and said, hey, we've got a runner position going at Strong Room. Do you want to come and have an interview? Which I was surprised at because I'm sure I'd left a bad impression. But um, but I think he, I think I was always in and out of the studios and I think so he was always quite impressed with me just making the most out of my time the good there. Work, the good work ethic. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I went along for an interview and just ended up doing one day a week at Strong Room for a while and then ended up getting a full-time position as a runner sort of quit any other part-time job that I had at the time. And that was around my last term of being at SAE. So it, it crossed over quite nicely. That was kind of my start of getting into Strong Room. And then I was there as a runner for about um, maybe a, a year and a half, but I started assisting pretty much straight away, but very much on what we call teas and keys sessions. So you just give people tea and open the doors. So teas and keys. So a lot of that at the start, mm. <laughs> and then it's, you ended up getting more and more advanced and I was doing sort of assisting vocal sessions for a bit and then assisting more full band sessions and I'd assist engineers who worked there so they were really really supportive in in getting you trained up with engineers that are already there yeah it seems like a a great place like I've I've, I mean maybe it's just because the people that I've interviewed I've heard a lot about strong room you know studios and they seem to like get a lot of people through the door and like in an era where the, a lot, not a lot of that is happening, right? Yeah. Like, no, they're brilliant. They're, they're really good. I they're, couldn't come up through a studio. I had to just open a business. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah no, they are. They're, they're really good. They're good, particularly at hiring quite a gender diverse team, I think, compared yeah, to, to that, many studios. Obviously, That's it's great. just there's maybe maybe less interest from women. That's a whole topic to debate anyway. But um, they are very, very good at hiring quite a gender diverse team. At the time, there had been a a couple of female engineers who'd come up through Strong Room, but at that time, I was the only female member of staff on the engineering side of things. And now there's Mm -hmm. quite a few and non-binary. And so it's a good place to work, good place to meet people, really good place to train up as well. And then that's kind of been my main place of work for the last five years, although I've, I've dipped in and out of other places being freelance. I've really enjoyed working there. And so, so now these days you're almost entirely freelance. You're working out of, or you're entirely freelance, right? Yes. Tell me about that transition from like being, you know, tea and keys to, you know, you know, getting clients and working with artists and, you know, getting hired. What was that transition like? The transition was good. I, I, yeah, I think I, I started working at Red Bull about ni- tw- the start of 2019. I started working at Red Bull as an engineer there and I met quite a few different people there and I was also Red Bull was 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 brilliant to learn actually because they Strong Room is very very client based and they they you spend like a good few hours setting up and the structure of the day is quite rigid whereas at Red Bull you kind of just get chucked in quite at the deep end and you don't really know what you're going to record every day. Yeah, it was just a brilliant place to learn in that sense. So I met quite a few people there and then 
during the pandemic, Red Bull hasn't reopened, but we had a few remote sessions with people. So I was at home on Zoom, kind of like I am now. And some artists who needed some support, um, I'd give them like a mixed tutorial over Zoom. And through that, I met a couple of a couple of clients who I'm still working with now. So I met one violinist called Rebecca Reed. And with Becca, we ended up really hitting it off over Zoom. And we ended up, I ended up co-producing an album for uh, a collective that she fronts called Tap Collective, which is very, very sort of genre bending, bunch of different influences. She, she's mainly a loop pedal artist with the violin, but she brings in influences from like jazz, drill, pop, disco, uh, a little bit of everything. Mm. So that was that's been really great. And then another artist called, uh, I met a guy called Danny who fronts a band called Project Hilts and he's a rapper and they kind of do like jazz meets rap. Weirdly, seeing as I work in the music industry, I'm not very good at describing genres sometimes, but <laughs> they're, 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 they're brilliant. So I mostly engineer for them. I don't do any production, uh, but they, they're they just really fun whenever they come in. Um, I They came in over the pandemic and recorded a live video at Strong Room. And then I'd mixed their EP and then recently they've come in again to do some recording. So, yeah, got some more stuff in the pipeline with them. So I guess it's just like kind of like, you know, word of mouth, I guess. You get yeah. a couple of clients through the door and then things start to spiral. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a lot of word of mouth. And then Sri Becker, she actually works with an artist called Andrea, a singer called Andrea, who I'd worked with years ago at uni. And we've got put back in touch and now I'm doing her album. So that's Anders Fai. So yeah, I've been doing her album and it's quite nice to see the crossover of different musicians. So like there's quite a few musicians that I work with that cross over into different projects, either through me or just accidentally. So there's quite a nice community, it feels, in in London. And it's a big city, right? It's like a big hub. It is a big city, but it's kind of small. I feel like it's small when you when you get into it, when you're working in the music industry and you're in particular genres, it feels mm. smaller than you expect. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so. I always felt like England had it right when it came to like, I don't know, caring about music. I don't know. I remember like just, I, I've only been to England twice, but, you know, I just remember seeing billboards for like, you know, songs when like nobody was like into like music, you know, I guess where I'm living or in America. And it just, people just seem like really passionate about it. It's like, there's like a, I don't know, some of my favorite records are, are you know British obviously <laughs> so yeah nice know, there's, there's something in the water there nice yeah 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 definitely did you come to London when you were here yeah my sister was living uh in London for a while or for like a year she was doing like a master's somewhere at uh what is it the British Academy of Royal Dramatic Arts or, or something oh yeah something like that. Rada, Rada, I think. yeah rather she was doing she was doing a, a degree a degree there uh, and then I just went one time to with my wife, we just went to see Fly the Concords because they were playing in England. This oh, was, amazing. Uh, four years ago. <laughs> that must have been a where, good game. When else am I, Where else am I going to go see Fly of the Concords if I live in Israel? So it just kind of <laughs> happened. <laughs> but were they great. good? Did it live up to your expectations? Oh, yeah, it was awesome. I mean, it was actually in Portsmouth, not in not in London. But, okay, you know, sweet. You go to London because that's, that's, yeah. where, that's where you go. Where you fly. And that's, uh, so, so tell me a little bit about, you know, these days, you know, when you're working with artists or kind of how do you find artists to work with or how do they find you? Um, and how do you decide if it's going to be a good fit working together? Ooh, I think it's, yeah, very, very different with every single person I work with. I think I do a lot of sessions, you know, at, at Strong Room with people that I haven't brought in, that I'm just like booked onto a session and you you quite quickly have to suss mm -hmm. out what sort of artist or producer they are you know, find out what they need. A lot of the time, if you're assisting, for example, they might not even want you in the room. So you kind of have to quite quickly be like, okay, I'm just on a T's and keys things here and I'll, I'm just there to help out if I can. Sometimes they might want you in for a bit and not for other, for, you know, for when they're doing a very intimate vocal, for example, they might sort of want you to make yourself scarce then, be around mm -hmm. on hand for the rest of it. So a lot of it's working out who you're working with rather than the other way around. I think the sort of longer term clients that I've had yeah you do end up really I've, uh, yeah a lot of the artists that I've worked with and I've, I've become very close friends with so Rebecca for example the, the violinist of Tap Collective we're we're really good friends now um <clears throat> I just went and saw a gig of hers last night she was playing violin for Soul to Soul and she just smashed it she was absolutely amazing I've got a friend called Johanna yeah so another artist that I work with is called Nayo and she's just released an EP um which is beautiful it's called Garden of Eden 
if anybody wants to check that out. 